So let's talk about another challenge of the RHME3 CTF. And that is the white box challenge. That's the other challenge that I've solved. So for this challenge, I want to go a little bit of a different route because in the end, I am not satisfied with how I solved it. I used a tool that I didn't really understand and I still spent many, many hours on this challenge and explored it in, in great depth, but it didn't help me really with the solution. I had several attack ideas, but in the end, they all didn't work out. And so instead of giving you like a sequential write-up of what you can do to solve this challenge or show you the tool that I've used. I try to revisit what I thought at different stages when I approach this challenge. There's a chance that you have already heard about what it is about or you even solved it yourself with this tool but would like to dig a little bit deeper into it. Before we head into, I think I will just tell you basically what the solution was. And then with keeping that in mind, we then explore the steps I've taken. And you can also then think about where were my mistakes? Why did I go down a route that kind of didn't lead me to the solution? Or how far did I get with the knowledge? Or where I just don't know enough yet? So I figure that's a lot more interesting. So the title is White Box. What it actually implements this binary is AES encryption. And AES encryption looks a little bit intimidating when you see the algorithm for the first time. There are a lot of steps involved that seem arbitrary or weird, but you know, you don't really have to understand it in full. You kind of just break it down into little steps and then you can understand the single steps of AES even if you don't really understand their purpose. But in the end, this binary implemented AES encryption. And so somehow this algorithm must be present in this binary it would somehow have to implement each of these steps. So for example, let's see what the add round key step is. And we can, for example, go to Wikipedia and just then look up the step for add round key. And so it tells us here that add round key is the step where the sub key is combined with the state. For each round, a sub key is derived from the main key using a key schedule. And each sub key is the same size as a state. So if that sounds maybe very weird at first, but if you look on the picture, it's pretty easy. So you have your block size of, for example, 16 bytes for, for the AES. And then you have also a round key and you just X all them together. And that those are your resulting 16 bytes. And it's just here ordered in a nice four to four matrix, but these are just your 16 bytes. So this means there's, for example, a very prominent XOR step in AES, where you have your plain text and where you have your first key, that's the first key you enter and it's XORed and that becomes then this, the next 16 state bytes for the next steps in the algorithm. So the next one would be sub bytes and then you can look at uh, sub bytes and what it does and it's basically just a substitution. It's kind of like a, not a Caesar cipher, the other one, a visionaire where you just replace one character with another one based on a table. And that's what the S box basically just is. So this can also be easily reversed. If I know the result and I know the S box, I can say, ah, that was produced by this byte. So all these operations have to be somehow implemented in there. And like I said, the first add round key would just XOR the key. And the question of the challenge was, can you extract the key? So it would be super easy to just find the part in the program where this round key is XORed and we just read out the bytes that were XORed and then we would have it solved. But that's the idea behind white box cryptography. The challenge that white box cryptography aims to address is to implement a cryptographic algorithm in software in such a way that cryptographic assets remain secure even when subject to white box attacks. So even if we have the binary and can basically do a white box approach, can just like look into read the code, read the assembler code of it, we still shouldn't be able to get the key. That's the idea behind white box cryptography. It's obviously very challenging and there are obviously a lot of attacks and it's quite interesting. The, the idea is basically that you take an algorithm that takes a key and a ciphertext and has these very defined steps and you kind of just encode the key already fixed into the steps and it becomes in a kind of a weird thing where the key is just already in there. I think intuitively that makes totally sense. And when I first read it, then I thought, oh, that's pretty clever. But obviously the devil's in the detail. How is this done? And can you 
infer back to the key that was encoded in, in these kind of steps. And basically that's the whole idea behind the attack here. And obviously there are a lot of protection mechanisms, how you can hide or obscure the key. And basically the challenge already implemented certain mitigations because that is an active field of research and there are tools available that people have written their theses about that you can just apply to such a program in it. You basically use similar techniques that you would use on hardware crypto attacks to get the key out on now a software. So that's actually pretty cool. But so the solution was about figuring out that this is AES, that this is a white box cryptography, that that's a thing, and that you somehow have to figure out the key that is somehow encoded in the workflow. So now that you know what kind of the goal of this is, let's rewind and go back to the beginning how I started and approached this challenge. Because I did not know that white box is a thing. Obviously one of the first steps that I did was just checking out the binary itself. And so you can see it's a 64-bit Linux binary. It's stripped, so there are no symbols, unlike with the other exploitation challenge. When you execute it, you have two methods to invoke the crypto algorithm. You can either pass 16 bytes, the plain text that you want to encrypt as a parameter, uh, or you can use standard input by, for example, here piping into the binary, uh, the, the 16 bytes. So then I just like typed in a very first test was all the 16 bytes and changed the last byte into a B and checked is there any obvious correlation. For example, does the last byte changed also change the last byte of the output. But that was not the case. So I assumed, okay, this is a little bit more involved than just, for example, a simple XOR or something like that. So the next step was obviously opening up this inner disassembler. So here this time I'm using Hopper for reverse engineering. So this is a strip binary and we have not really talked about this before. But how do you find the main function when there are no symbols involved and main is not named? The entry point is where the binary really starts. But that is before main. This is basically where libc is kind of setting up everything for you before it starts main. You can see here that the entry point calls then libc start main. And that function has three parameters and Hopper already automatically decodes these. So you can see that this is fini, this is init, and this is main. These are three function pointers to stuff that run at certain times, but the big main function that you usually define when writing C is this argument. So that's always pretty easy to find. So let's have a look. The first time when I scrolled here, I immediately thought, wait, this is a bit odd. Because you see here how Hopper colors this yellow and this is white. It's a little bit weird because it usually colors everything nice and defines everything to be a nice procedure. But it's kind of failing here, that's why it's becoming white. And the reason for this is because there doesn't seem to be a return. If you look here, there's like here a jump RAX, an unconditional jump, so it will always jump here to somewhere else. And it's based on a register, so it dynamically decides where it will go. And the hopper has obviously some difficulties to figuring out where that would jump to. Usually you would expect that at the end of main is a return. So what's going on here? We have some kind of function here and then we have RAX here. So let's maybe peek first into the function what this is. Okay, so this calls a lot of other functions. And when you follow this, then you find this very weird thing moving numbers into another place. A lot of numbers into a different place. So what does the next function do? Also moves numbers, just different numbers into a place. And another function also very big large numbers into into a weird place. We don't know yet what these functions do, but I mean it's clear that somehow data is set up. And at first I was thinking, oh does it decrypt its own code? So is it just like loading some data into memory and then it will run some decryption on it and that's how the algorithm is hidden? But that would be kind of weird because the data does seem to follow a certain pattern. At least the first one here you see is just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and so forth. The other ones seem a bit more random but it's not really code if you try to decode it. So there's just a lot of data being set up and that's quite interesting. Okay, so this just seems to be a setup routine. Whatever it's setting up, I don't know. Let's have a look at this jump RIX because that's super suspicious. That happens immediately after the setup. So we can see here that RIX, where it will jump to, it is referenced based on an address that is calculated. So how is this calculated? Here's some kind of variable, var40. 
that is loaded into RAX. So that's a local variable. Then we shift this left by three. So what does this mean? If we had like the number four, we would shift it left by three. So one, two, three, it becomes 32. And you can see here how the bits are shifting. Let's do another example. Let's do three and then one, two, three. It's 24. Let's do another one, five. 5 and shift to the left by 3 is 40. So if you notice, that is always just multiplication by 8. 40 divided divided by 8 is 5. And the 24 from earlier divided by 8 is the 3. So this is just multiplying it by 8, which kind of makes sense if this is probably an array of addresses and this is the index into that array. So if you want to get the third item in this array, so that would be the index two, you would do two times eight, and then you add it to there, and then you get to the position in the array. So this means all this data here are functions that are possibly being called, depending on whatever value is in that local variable. So we can define all of this as eight byte values. And we can check them out and we see, oh yeah, these do look indeed like valid functions. That is definitely valid code here. If you pay attention, for example, here, it looks like it would jump in the middle and it should be wrong, but it is not because just before it is a jump. So that will always jump away. So this is the end of whatever is here before. This means this here is a perfectly fine function in itself. And you can see here, it also ends in a jump. When you pay attention, all of these ones end in basically the same jump. So we can define, we can say this is one function that we have and it ends in this jump. And this one is also probably another function and ends in the same jump. And this is probably also another function and ends in the same jump. So what is up with this? Let's see where this jump goes to. Okay, so it goes here and there's immediately another jump into main. And then we see where main goes to. It leads here. Look at this. This is just before the jump RAX again. And var 40 is the index that is used for the jump table. So this is index jump table. So let's go back where we just came from and see what happens before we jump. You see here again the hex 40. Now Hopper, just because of this weird calling convention that is not typical, Hopper doesn't realize that all these things are the same one, but you always see them, the same patterns. You have RVP minus hex 40, and then the jump into main basically again. You can see here it's moving six in here, and it's moving here A in here. So this is preparing where it will continue to. So a six arrives here. It's definitely not above hex 11, so it's fine. So it's going into RAX, so we have six here. Now we perform a shift left, so it's six times eight. And then we add the address to here. And basically this means one, two, three, four, five, six. So it, it should call this function here. And this function here then ends in the same way. It moves four in here. And so one, two, three, four. So it would call probably this function. And this one is interesting. See this, here's a compare. Some value is compared to F. And in this one case, it loads the index of the jump table with two. But in the other case, it will load it with one. So here we have an if case, a branch, that either this, the function one or the function two is executed. And basically now we understand the flow of the program. And that's basically one of the first things that I figured out. Before I wrap up this video, I thought it would be really cool to compare the disassembly between Binary Ninja and Hopper. And as you can see, Binary Ninja also drops us at the entry point called start. And it also recognizes Finny, init, and main. But it does not only comment that those are the possible parameters, but it uses this detection also to automatically rename the main function for us. So even though there's no symbols included, it does name this function main. But much more interesting is how Binary Ninja deals with the jump table. Because as you can see here, there are a lot of branches away from the jump RAX. So Binary Ninja has the capability to recognize this jump tables like this. And also what's really cool is that when you rename the variable that is holding the index for the jump table, it does not only have this name in the main function, but it also applies to all the other function. Binary Ninja recognizes that this is a kind of global variable used for the index of the jump table. And so in all of the little functions, you can see here how A is moved into the index of the jump table or six is moved into the index of the jump table. So, Binary Ninja performs here really, really well.